I'm Pastor Leon Pinkett. In the heart of East Baltimore at the corner of East Fayette and Patterson Park Avenue, New Harvest is a diverse, inner city, multicultural, multiracial ministry that focuses on advancing God's kingdom by equipping each member through sound biblical training, an interactive and supportive fellowship, and our consistent and intentional community and outreach efforts. Known for our loving and family atmosphere, New Harvest is exactly the place for you if you desire a fervent, vibrant worship experience for all ages in a compassionate and loving environment. On behalf of Bishop Marcus Aaron Johnson Sr., Evangelist Rone Johnson, and the entire New Harvest family, we invite you to worship, study, or visit with us at New Harvest Ministry. God bless you. I stand representing every faith leader in the city of Baltimore that we are declaring that Baltimore belongs to God and so we are giving God back the city that once glorified him giving him back the city that once took care of the people its constituency we're giving it back to God and we're believing God to raise up a harvest in this city generations that will walk in their divine destiny and that will declare to the utmost Jesus saves. I prophesy over this city that is experiencing all kind of blight that there will be a prophetic release of greatness and goodness and manifestation of God's purpose for this city in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, first of all, it's clear to me that heaven was endorsing this because God gave us beautiful weather. And, and with all the rain that we've had to be able to function because we were outdoors, that was a blessing. But then just to see the synergy of all the different churches and the people coming together of different ages, races, different denominations, just coming together as one, one church moving throughout Baltimore with one one purpose and that's to pray that God would change the trajectory of the negativity and turn this thing around and I, I'm excited even for next year it's got to be even bigger and better I'm really excited about it there's an arrow on the agenda for the motorcade and it says that this is the last stop I, 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 I think it was a typo. I know Bishop was up late doing this, so, but it says that this is the last stop. Well, I, I came to inform you today that this is not the last stop. This is not the last stop.
and smash that like button and smash the notification bell so you won't miss another video. Thank you for bringing us all here safe.
of my duplicity. Now there is no record. You assume the best of me. And this is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. So I will sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. All of my attention, everything I have to give. It's measured in the praise I lift. So this is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. So I will sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. This is how I thank the Lord for loving me. So I will sing, this is how I thank the Lord for everything, this is how I thank the Lord. I will sing, I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. I will sing, and I will sing, I will lift. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. While the seasons change, our desire and passion to worship our God never changes, for He's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. I'm Assistant Pastor Leon Pinkett, and I welcome you to worship with the New Harvest family on our virtual campus on behalf of Bishop Marcus Aaron Johnson Sr. and the entire New Harvest family. We welcome you to join into this worship experience. Whether you're on your laptop, your tablet, your phone, or any other device, we ask you to just lean in and join with us as we worship our eternal God. We pray that you be blessed through this worship experience and find richer, deeper walk with our God. God bless you. Do we understand where we at and who we belong to? When he comes in the room, all the angels, they praise him and they worship him. How about us whom he have redeemed from death into his marvelous light? Welcome to New Harvest Ministries, where the pastor is Bishop Marcus Aaron Johnson Sr the third, his wife, first lady, Rone. Come on, let's give the Lord praise and let us pray. Father, we want to thank you, dear Lord, for another day, another day of your goodness, another day of your grace, another day of your mercy. As a matter of scripture, had not the Lord been on our side, where would any of us be? For Lord, your steadfast love, you have been faithful unto us. Even when we're not faithful unto thee, thou changest not. Lord, we want to be able to say that we love you because we keep your commandments. You have been merciful. You have been gracious. You have been kind unto us. And all we can say is thank you, Jesus, for all that you do for us. And we praise you and we want to lift you up in this place, dear Lord, for this is the day that the Lord have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Undeserved anything that you do for us. And we just wanted to say thank you, Jesus, as we worship you and praise you in your home. 
Thank you. Now let us all stand. We're going to read the scripture and it will be coming out of Psalms 121 in its entirety. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time? As a matter of fact, how, how about in the land of the living? Songs 121 in its entirety. Everybody have the word? I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from evil, and he shall preserve thy soul. Verse 8, the Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Praise the Lord for the giving of his word. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody, for this is the day that the Lord has made. Can we continue to rejoice and be glad in it? Come on, that's the equation. This is the day that the Lord has made. It's our job to rejoice and be glad in it. Can I see the faces of some people who are ready to be glad in the day that the Lord has made for all the things that he has done? Is anybody grateful for all the things the Lord has done? Come on, starting with Calvary. If you're grateful for Calvary, someone say, Lord, thank you for Calvary. And if you're grateful, one more time, clap your hands for Calvary. Song is simple, it says, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thou shalt the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorns they Only me to Calvary. Help me say, King of my life, King of my life. Thy, 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 thy. Come on, 
forget thine agony. And if I ever forget God's love for me, just give me a glimpse of Calvary. If you're grateful for the cross, can you join me in lifting your hands? Lord, we thank you today for all the great things you have done. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for starting us on our way. Thank you for the little things we forget to thank you for. But thank you for 2,000 years ago, for Calvary. And we declare today that we love you with all of our hearts. So I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Say, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord. I hear you singing it out. Because you care for me in such a special way.
Jesus. He loves you. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you. Is anybody grateful to be loved by the Lord?
and strong enough to lift you. I lift my hands and toe to adoration unto you. Oh Lord, I thank you. Cause you reign on the throne for you are God and God. You know. 
New Harvest family and friends. We serve a great and mighty God, and we'd like to invite you to help us share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. Will you follow me over to thenewharvest.org and you can click on the giving tab or you can use the giving button on the page. Whatever amount you decide to share is greatly appreciated. Our prayer is that God will continue to bless and keep you. Action! Subscribe to New Harvest Ministry and smash that like button and smash the notification bell so you won't miss another video. something that you need to thank God for? If so, go ahead and thank him right now. Come on. And maybe you did thank him, but you want to thank him again. Go ahead and thank him. Hallelujah to God. Oh, the Lord should be able to walk all through this sanctuary and just be bombarded with thanks and praise. Hallelujah. And nobody should be begged to praise God. If you can hear me, you have a thanks to give to God. Go on and bless God all over the house. Come on. Go on and bless him. Just bless him. Just bless him. Bless him because you can. Bless him because you have enough sense to know that he's worthy of all of our praise. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, O oh, ye land. Put your hands together, everyone. Into the name of the Lord. He's a strong tower. The righteous run in and are saved. How many of you love God today? In the sanctuary, virtually, wherever you are tuned in, because God is absolutely God. Nothing needs to be added to him and nothing can be taken away from him. The same God that said, let there be light is the same God that's loving on us right now. And he has gone before us. He is with us. And he's also our rear guard. He's coming behind us. 
No wonder Isaiah said, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Why? Because God is all around us and he is there to sustain us and to make his goodness known in our lives. I am so grateful to stand before you today. I can say, as the song says, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. But it's what? What is it? It's grace that has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me on. I am just so thankful and just grateful on this coming Tuesday, my mother will be 89 years old. On this coming Tuesday, October the 8th, it's a loaded month. There's so many birthdays. If you have a birthday in the month of October, stand to your feet. We want to acknowledge you. If you have a birthday in the month of October, come on, give them another hand. Give them another hand. Happy birthday to each and every one of you. We celebrate you and we celebrate God who has given us the gift of life. And for this, we thank the Lord. Mom, I think you'll be the oldest among us uh, in terms of birthdays for October. And so we will make a fuss over you on Tuesday. We'll figure that piece out. This morning, I want to continue as we've been talking about grace we've been talking about grace and we are learning that grace is a big topic it's a big topic and so I would like to turn your attention to second kings second kings chapter six second kings chapter six and I'm going to begin reading at verse eight down to verse 17. Second Kings chapter 6, beginning at verse 8. And I'm reading from the King James Version, and it reads, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. This is the Aramean king or Syrian king saying, We're going to set up camp over such and such a place. And the man of God, Isaiah, the man of God, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place. So the prophet heard what the Syrian king was saying in private. The Lord gave him intel. For thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once nor twice. There were several deliverances because the prophet got divine intel. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria, how in the world did he know I was going to come here? So the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? One of you must be a spy. Because there's no way he would have known except one of you told him. And one of his servants said, None, my lord. None of us are spies, O king. But Elisha, the prophet, that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. So you think you're speaking in private, but God heard you. And God have disclosed your secret. And he said, go and spy where Elisha is, that I may send and fetch him. I'll take care of him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. Oh, Elisha, we got you now. 
And when the servant of the man of God, when Elisha's servant was risen early that morning and gone forth, behold, and hosts come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And Elisha's servant said unto him, Oh my God, alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, Elisha's servant, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. This morning, I want to speak on this thought, grace to pray for divine sight. Grace to pray for divine sight. Bow your heads, everyone. Father, we bless your sweet, holy, and everlasting name. We adore you, for you are God and God alone. And we bow before thee, because you are worthy of our sacrifices of praise. Now, God, we're living in a very difficult age, and we need to be able to see. But without divine vision, we will grope around in the darkness, and we will fall into danger. But if you would open our eyes, grant us divine vision vision and we are going to trust you we're going to depend upon you and we're going to lean upon you to help us to see in the name of Jesus we pray amen our theme is seeing hearing and discovering prepared miracles but we can't appreciate what God has prepared if we don't have the vision to see it. And so in our lesson today, we are indeed asking for God to enable us to see what God has prepared. On last Sunday, we spoke on grace to pray God's thoughts as our very own. We, we, we discovered an insight that when we pray God's will, that we are guaranteed an affirmative yes from God. The premise of this word is whatever God is thinking is always God's will. So whenever we pray God's thoughts, we are praying his will. Therefore, God will hear our petition and he will grant the request that we've made. The secret is praying the will of God, not imposing my will upon God, but seeking God's will and then offering it back to God in the form of my petition. And when we do this, we are pleasing God because he's hearing what he desires. Why? Because God will never deny himself of his plans or his desires for us. Isn't it amazing that God often has to struggle with us to bless us? And the Lord is saying, you think you know what's best for you, but you're not omniscient. You don't know everything. And so based upon my all-knowingness, I know what you need. I know what's best for you. And I don't want to just give you what will satisfy you for the moment. I want to give you what will satisfy you for the season. I want to give you what will safeguard you from what is 
being set as a trap for you. And so pardon me if I don't give you what you asked, but I'm going to give you what you need. Victorious prayer then is praying the will of God that is a guaranteed yes. Somebody say yes. yes. It's guaranteed. Have you ever asked somebody something and you already knew they were going to say yes? So you, you, you weren't sheepish about it. You, you, you weren't timid about it because I already know before I ask you that it's already your desire. And so I'm simply just going to ask you what you want anyway. And therefore, I know God is going to give me what his will is. And then on this past Wednesday night, and I want to thank those of you that press your way out this past Wednesday night, we will come back again on the third Wednesday night of the month. But on this past Wednesday night, we discussed grace to pray because of the atonement, which is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we shared that the atonement simply means at one meant. Breaking the word up is being at one with God, being aligned with God. And because man fell and man was out of alignment with God and really incapable of praying effectively on his own. But Jesus Christ came to link us back up with God through his death on the cross, through the shedding of his blood, enabling the communication line to be opened up again. And one of our very precious saints told us that the first wireless connection was prayer. The first wireless connection was prayer. Perhaps in the Old Testament, they had to depend upon legalism or the law. So maybe their prayer was wired. But since Jesus, but since Calvary, since the Holy Ghost has come to dwell in us, we have a wireless connection with God. And we're able to communicate with him and he with us. The premise of the lesson on Wednesday night is that Atonement has removed all the barriers that block effective prayer. And it was done at the cross when Jesus said it is finished. In other words, Jesus' death removed all the barriers, enabling us to enter boldly into the throne of grace and to make our requests known unto God. For that you ought to say, thank you, Jesus. So now today, we're going further by acknowledging that we have not yet seen all of what God has already done and already exists for us. I want us to be real clear. What we are petitioning God for is not something God will have to create. It already exists. Every blessing from earth to glory on your behalf already exists. Take five seconds and thank God for that. I mean, because if it doesn't exist, that means it has to be created. And then we're dealing with time and reason, all that. But I'm here to tell you, God is so on point until everything I could ever need already exists on my behalf. And the fallacy is what we don't see in the natural doesn't yet exist. Because I can't see the job, I think I still don't have it. Because I can't see the prospective mate in my life, then I think I don't have it. Because I can't see the answer to my situation, then I think I don't have it. And somehow I've got to convince God to bring about what I so desperately need. As though God is uninformed. This is so untrue because whatever God has promised already exists. Though we wait to see its manifestation, we do not wait for its existence. In our text, 
the prophet Elisha can see in the spirit realm. And what is he looking at? He's looking at God's reality that's unveiled the wicked king of Syria or Aram. It's unveiled his plot to attack Israel. The plot already had been made. And so Elisha, seeing in the spirit, was able to see what had already been planned. Somebody say, thank God for Jesus. And in our text, the prophet Elijah, who is now seeing in the spirit, now goes to the king of Israel and he shares divine intel with Israel's king who repeatedly is able to evade a Syrian attack. How was he able to avoid it? Because he had information. How did he get the information? Because the prophet Elisha could see in the spirit. I'm going to tell you right now, the day we start seeing in the spirit, the kingdom of darkness is in trouble. The day we start seeing through the eyes of God, then the kingdom of darkness is in big trouble because the devil won't be able to camouflage reality because we will be able to detect it because God sees everything. And God who sees everything wants us to tap into his vision. So the Syrian king thought he had a spy among his servants. And that was who was tipping off the king of Israel. Until one of his servants informed him that it's Elisha the prophet. He's telling the secrets. And he's giving it to God's man, the king of Israel. In other words, the prophet Elisha had divine sight that provided the necessary information to avoid his enemy's scheme. When we wake up in the morning, when we wake up in the morning, before we start our day, we need to ask God to anoint our eyes. We need to ask God who sees everything to grant us divine vision, divine hearing, divine sensory, so that we are not depending upon our human faculties to identify spiritual reality. Many Christians base their actions upon their human senses. And then we're shocked when things turn out another way. But the intel was always available. When we woke up in the morning, God says, I've got brand new mercies for you. And in these mercies are intelligence that you could never acquire on your own. And I don't want you to discover the realities after the fact. But I want you to walk into a room with your eyes wide open. I want you to walk into a situation before you go for your doctor's appointment. I want your eyes open, not so much to what the doctor sees, but what God sees. And even though what the doctor may see may be a reality... But what God sees is truth. And truth overrides natural reality. I just need three people to, 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 to touch and agree with me right now. I, I, I don't need a whole host of you all because sometimes it's difficult to get a lot of people on the same page. But if I could just get a handful of you on the same page, you will discover God is speaking directly to your situation. And God, listen, God is not preparing himself. 
God is trying to prepare us. And so God is giving us what we need before we need it. So that when we walk into it, we already have everything that we need. According as his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And so we, ne we never have to be unprepared. Not when we allow God to touch our eyes. Listen to this. So Elisha, who had divine sight, divine vision, prayed that God would open his servant's eyes. Why? Why? Because Elisha's servant could only see the problem. Come on, somebody. And there's some folk at the drop of a hat, they can tell you the problem. They can run it down for you. But as a believer, if all we see is the problem, then we are short-sighted. If all I can tell you is what's wrong, if all I can tell you is what happened last time that failed, if all I can tell you is all of the steps that lead up to a disappointment, I'm short-sighted. And God is saying, I'm not denying that those things that you have seen don't exist. But what I am trying to tell you is that your problem is not the only occupant in the room. Before your problem showed up, the answer had already arrived. As a matter of fact, your answer had a reserved seat. And when the problem walked in, the answer identified the problem. God is saying, if you let me touch your eyes, I want you to see more than your problem. Somebody say, help me, Lord. Here's point number one. Point number one. Our natural eyes Focus upon natural things that are temporal realities. Our natural eyes focus upon natural things that are temporal realities. Here's the example. Elisha's servant saw the Syrian troops. That was a natural reality. And it was a natural phenomenon. But because that's all the servant saw, get the point now, that became the servant's reality. You get my point? That's all he saw. So as far as he was concerned, that was the only thing that existed. And if we're not careful, we will react to temporal realities as though it is an eternal truth. We will throw in the towel when we've got more going for us than against us. We will quit right when God's about to push the button. We will walk out on our panacea. We will conclude this was the wrong door for me to walk in. And Jesus says, how could it be the wrong door if I'm the door? If you walk through me, how could you walk in the wrong room? If it was the wrong room, when I became the door, it became the right room. I'll make the darkness light before you. And what's wrong, I'll make it right before you. Listen, to be short-sighted is to make the problem, the giant. To be short-sighted is to make the problem the terminus point. But, but, but to have the vision of God, 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things 
which are seen. And some of you sitting in here right now and listening to me virtually are focusing on seen things. And that's why you're stuck. You haven't been able to praise God the way you should because you can't get past what you see in the natural. Could God, if you could understand that your praise can pierce through every enemy, your praise can pierce through every obstruction, your praise can pierce through every problem that has erupted in your life, your praise can do it. Somebody give God the praise. Elisha's servant, listen, was only seen through his natural eyes. Therefore, the natural things that were temporary became his reality. Point number two. Our spiritual eyes focus upon spiritual things. Remember now, natural focuses on what? So our spiritual eyes focuses upon spiritual things that are eternal and are God's reality. I'm going to say to all of you sitting over here on this side, I'm not ignoring you, but on this side, what would your week be like if you lived it according to God's reality? I say God's reality. I don't care what you're dealing with. If you face it with God's reality, I promise you, your experience will be glorious. Okay, got little response. Let's try this side. <laughs> if you leave here today according to God's reality, you will find yourself chuckling at a problem. Then I'll just talk to this side. I'm, I'm just trying to say, I'm going to give you another chance over here. I'm going to give you another opportunity. Now I want you to hunt your neighbor on this side and say, come on, y'all, wake up. Come on, come on, come on, come on, wake up, wake up. There really should be more energy over here because you're younger. I'm going to try it again. What would happen? <laughs> oh, that's a good start. That's a good start. What would happen if you would live this week according to God's reality? I want this side to say carnal. <laughs> That's good. But, but, but to the whole congregation, what would happen if when you deal with your bills, if you deal with your medical report, if you deal with your employment, if you deal with your relationships, if you deal with everything that affects you, if you approached it from God's reality? David did it when he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dare come against God's servant? I know you're a giant and I know everybody's afraid of you, but God's not. And even though you may stand over me, you don't stand over God. And I want us to know in this house today, the enemy is not God bigger than God. Neither is he bigger than our answer. Listen, whereas Elisha's servant saw the enemy, Elisha in the spirit saw a larger heavenly host that was not coming, it was there. And I want you to know your answer is here. It's here right now. 2 Kings 6 and 16 says it like this, and he answered, Fear not, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And sometimes we are focusing on the minority. And I'm not talking about race. Sometimes we're, we're focusing on the temporal. We need to focus on the majority. And if 
everybody is against us. If God be for us, we have the majority. Say hallelujah, somebody. Point number three. I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished because I want you to come back this evening. We have a special service and a special guest that's coming this evening. And I want you back for it. Lord, you're going to be so uplifted when you find out who's coming tonight. But anyway, point number three. Listen to this. Graceless. Graceless. That means without grace. Graceless prayers consist of human reasoning that lack the confidence of God's yes. When I pray without grace, I'm praying by my own logic. I'm praying by my own intellect. I'm praying by my own experience. I'm praying by my own limited information. And when I pray like that, I don't have confidence that God's going to say yes. Therefore, it's difficult for me to rejoice when I don't have an assurance that God's got my back. And that's not because he doesn't love me. It's because I'm praying without his enablement. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Here's the example. The disciples asked Jesus why they were unable to cast out the demon of the possessed boy. And Jesus addressed their unbelief and lack of consecration. And he was saying to them, you are trying to minister to this boy with your human ability. But you're not doing it with the enablement of grace. We said grace is the person of God. So if you're trying to pray without God's help, we said grace is also the very uh, it, it, it's, it's the enablement of God. It's the thing of God, the person, place, and thing. Grace is also the location of God. It's the throne of grace. So if I'm praying apart from the throne of grace, if I'm praying apart from the person of grace, if I'm praying apart from the enablement of the Holy Spirit, then I'm using my own human intelligence to accomplish a spiritual assignment. And how many know it won't work? I will frustrate myself, and then I'll come to the conclusion prayer doesn't always work. No, if you don't work prayer the way it is designed, then you won't get the intended result. So, clearly, Elisha's servant was seeing with graceless prayer. He wasn't depending upon God. He wasn't saying, Lord, what shall we do? He went to his master and said it. But he was basically implying, we're sunk. The troops are surrounding us. We're trapped. Anybody ever felt trapped before? Come on, be honest. You ever felt trapped? When you feel like all of your options are gone, Grace number four, point number four. I say grace number four. Point number four. Grace less prayer is one thing, but grace filled prayers. I started to say graceful prayers. I said, no, I, I want to be real specific. Grace hyphen filled. Grace filled prayers consist of spiritual truths that give the assurance of God's yes. God wants us to start praying in the spirit that we automatically know we're in his will and we already know God's going to work it out. Come on, believers of God. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about strangers. Anybody in the covenant with God? We're going to be taking communion shortly. Anybody consider yourself a child of God? Then God wants us to come boldly unto him. And he didn't want us to come not clear or sure whether or not he's going to hear us. He wants us to know before we walk before his throne that he's already filled with our yeses. He just wants us to come to him. But come to him right according to his will. Grace-filled prayers consist of spiritual truths that give the assurance of God's yes. Here's the example. Elisha had a confident prayer life 
full of God's grace. And he was able then to tap into the mind, the heart, and the vision of God. Wake up, somebody. He tapped into it. I want to suggest that before we get real serious in prayer, we need to find God's mind. Before we start babbling off, before we start making our requests known, how about if we find out where is God's heart on the matter? And if I search out the heart of God, the Bible says the spirit search of all things, even the deep things of God. If I go there, some of our petitions will completely change. Because we will enter into God's reality. And when we come in there, we will say, I never saw that. I never knew that existed. I didn't know God was sending them here for that. Well, let me change my ask. Because for the most part, God is insulted by the size of our requests. God is saying, do you think I am impoverished that I don't have the resources to overcome your lack. And so you're asking me, God, if you just give me a meal, a meal, how are you going to feel? How are you going to feed a multitude if all I give you is a meal? But you didn't know your problem was a setup for somebody else's answer. And God let you walk into what you walk into, not because that was your final point. But God wanted you to trust me to override your condition. But if he's going to override yours, why not override everybody associated with you? God, I need you to bless my finances. I want you to look up and down your row and say, God, bless all of our finances this week. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on, come on. Don't, don't play with it. Don't play with it. You, you, you think he can't do that? Huh? I want you to take your hand and roll over your whole section and say, God, bless all of our finances this week. Now, if you really believe that's what God wants to do, praise him for it. Because you can have, oh, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Either he can or he can't. And by the way, before you ask God to do it, he already knows everybody's financial condition. Not only does he know that, he knows every demand that will be placed upon you this week. He knows what you don't know. So for you to say, God bless all of our finances, what you're saying, God, based upon what you know, release your grace. And because I know you're a loving God, I'm going to thank you right now. I'm going to bless you right now. And I don't have no reservation in my praise. I got another one for you. I want you to take your hand and wave it over your whole thing and say, God, open our eyes. Let us see your reality. Now give God the praise. Come on, church. Come on, church. We struggle when we really should be coasting along. God's got us. And this is the confidence. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. We're quoting this a lot because I wanted to get in your system. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, say anything. anything. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. No need in praying if God can't hear us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. God just wants us to ask and petition him according to his plans for our lives. And we, we quote Jeremiah 29, 11 a lot. 
For I know the thoughts that I think of thee, thoughts of peace and not of evil, and to bring thee to an expected end. But here's the amazing backdrop behind that scripture. You got to go before that. Verse 10 will give you insight. Israel or the people of God were in exile. And God was telling them through Jeremiah, I'm about to end your exile. The 70 years are just about over. And when you went into exile, I already told you it would be 70 years. But you're acting like it's forever. And what God is saying to us in this house today, your exile is just about over. Because I know the thoughts that I think of thee. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. And to, oh, I wish somebody could grab it in your belly and understand that the stuff you've been struggling over is timing out. It was timing out when it started. And it doesn't have the life expectancy that you thought it had. As a matter of fact, your problem is suffocating for a lack of oxygen and the more you praise God the more you suck up is oxygen I wish I had 12 people that would suck up your enemy's oxygen with praise with praise with praise suck it up there's not enough oxygen for me and my enemy to breathe. And I refuse not to breathe. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Why am I rejoicing? William, because the exile is just about over. And the Lord allowed the exile to teach us. So when I come out of the exile... I'm going to be more informed than I was before I went in. Good God, I reckon. Do you think I have not gained information since my accident? Huh? I've learned how to survive. I've learned how to roll over in pain. I've learned how to get on my back and look to the hills from whence cometh my help. I've learned how to tap into God's anesthetizing operation. And I found out sometimes if you really want to control pain, you got to get into prayer. You got to get into praise. And I got another one for you. If you really want to control pain, I dare you to get into prophecy. Oh, you didn't get that. You didn't get that. Because prophecy will not just address the moment, it will address beyond this. What's that song they say? After this, there will be what? There will be glory after this. When you really get in a painful situation, prophesy. There will be glory after this. Let me finish, let me finish. Point number five, whereas closed eyes cannot see, open eyes admit the light of truth and are able to see. Sometimes we're confronting our problems, our eyes are closed. How are you going to see the answer with closed eyes? But what are open eyes? Open eyes are eyes of faith. <laughs> and faith is not limited to space and time. So when my eyes are open, I literally explore God's reality. And in God's reality, touch your neighbor and say, don't miss this. In God, uh, thank you, Jayla, I saw that. In God's reality, nothing is impossible. And many of us have been living under the ceiling of, of impossibility. And God is saying, take the ceiling off and explore the unlimited realm of God's reality. 
The doctor said, we give you three days. And so this is what we're going to offer you. We're going to make you comfortable. I honestly believe if I had accepted that, I would not have lived beyond three days. But when he said it, every now and then we need to let a lie offend us. When he said it, it felt like a lie. You ever had somebody say something to you and you just didn't believe it? You looked at them and they looked like a liar. Their body language looked like a liar. <laughs> well, when he said that, something in me said not so. Well, where did the not so come from? God's reality. God was saying, I've got all these years already prepared for you. They are surrounding you. And you're going to let a false word of three days take you out? But guess what? There are some things that won't change until we put a word over top of it. So some of us have been thinking. God said, no, uh-uh, stop thinking. Start speaking. I had to open my mouth. Mom, you were there. Dad was there. I opened my mouth and looked at the doctor. And this is what I said to him, and I'm done. Doctor, I won't say his name. Is, it in, is his name in the book? Yeah, okay, I won't say his name. Almost said it. He's not in here, but nonetheless, you don't know who's related to who these days. I said, I'm laying on the stretcher, paralyzed from my waist down. He said, three days. And I'm laying there, my mother and my father standing right beside me in Hopkins. I looked at him, and I said, Dr. So-and-so, I respect your medical opinion. And I meant that because he was knowledgeable in the science beyond mine, my ability. But I said to him, I don't receive it. And then I said to him, not only am I not going to die. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was prophesying. See, if you get a lie, how do you handle a lie? You need a prophecy. Because a prophecy will override the lie. Because remember, a prophecy is either telling forth, speaking truth, or foretelling truth. So I had to override it, Tierra. And I said, not only am I not going to die, but I'm going to walk again. And you are going to see me walking in this hospital. So thank you for your attention, but I don't receive it. Can I tell you something? That doctor saw me walk again in Hopkins. He was among the staff. I believe when I said you will see me walk again that God told the angel make sure he is on duty when I heal him. If he's scheduled to be off then make sure he's here because he needs to witness the miraculous power of God. Now, in this case, I had not seen, but in through faith to the Elstons, by faith, I saw myself walking. No, whatever condition you're in right now that's unfavorable, you got to see yourself walking in the favor of God. And it's got to be counter to your problem. Close your eyes, everybody, all over the house. Close your eyes right now. I want you to envision yourself 
walking in victory in the very thing that has been lorded over your life. I want you to see yourself empowered. I want to see yourself advantage. I want you to see yourself in favor. I want you to see I want you to see yourself glorifying God. I want you to see yourself as a witness in spite of what the lie the enemy has told. God has reversed it. I want you to see yourself in advantage, walking in power, walking in grace, walking in God's thoughts that he thinks of you, thoughts of peace and not of evil and bringing you to the desired destination. And if you can see it, then give God the praise right now. Come on, give him the praise. Somebody give God a standing ovation. Somebody bless God. Come on, this is for your destiny. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. As it is written, I have not seen yet. Somebody say yet. God's reality, which cannot be seen through the natural eye. And by the way, you can't even feel God's presence simply through your natural senses. You can feel it, but it's limited. But when we open ourselves up into the spiritual arena, we tap into, we call it supernatural. But what we call supernatural, God calls natural. In other words, Miracles are God's natural. <laughs> and if we are naturalized citizens in the kingdom of God, then the miracles of God need to be our norm. It doesn't need to require a whole lot of whatever on our part because I have an expectation. I have an expectation that the drama going on in our world, God is the answer. And I just believe God wants to reverse some stuff. And he wants to use your hands and he wants to use your lips. He wants to use your presence to reverse the course of what the enemy has set in motion. And I don't think that's a big ask of God. As a matter of fact, he says, you are the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. Let your light, let your light, let your light so shine before all men. Now, why does your light need to shine? Because in order to see, you need light. And there are folk that can't see because they're surrounded with darkness. But we've got to know that we're light because the light is dwelling in us. So when I walk into that situation, I am admitting light into the realm of vision of those who've operated in darkness. That's when blinded eyes begin to open. And that's when folk begin to change from the inside out. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you allow this word to become so real to us? That this word would become so tangible to us. That this word will become so normalized to us until we will take that word can't and throw it away I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me because he opened my eyes to see what already exists and my miracle is 100% opposite of my problem. And for this, God, I thank you. For this, I praise you in Jesus' name. Clap your hands if you believe that. Come on, clap those hands. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So if you have a problem, don't bring it to me for me to commiserate with you. Don't bring me your problem for me to feel sad for you. I will be sympathetic. I will even be empathetic. But that's not where we're going to stop. We're going to cross over that line 
into God's reality. And we're going to watch God be God in Jesus' name. Is there anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins? Lord, I'm, I'm just excited about this word. I'm telling you, I'm excited about it. Uh, anyone needs to give your life to Christ? Anyone doesn't know Jesus and the pardon of your sins? If you raise your hand, we'll come to you. We will show you how to become a friend of God. Hallelujah to God. Raise your hand if you know Jesus, if you belong to him. Come on. Either you do or you don't. Praise God. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here looking for a church home? I want to be planted where I can be taught, where I can be instructed, where I can be groomed to live in God's reality. If you're here, oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I want to acknowledge our precious sister. I'm trying to remember her name. Sister... Stand up. Bless her heart. She went through the new members class today. Her and her great, great nephew. Come on, give her a bigger hand than that. Make some noise. She said to me this morning, I'm ready to get to work. I'm glad to be here and I'm ready to get to work. And we thank God. Thank you for going through your new members class. May the Lord continue to bless your every effort, you and your great, great nephew. Is he your great, great? Beautiful. I did it right. I do a few things right around here. God bless you. And we're also praying for Brother Guy, who is, in, he's in North Carolina. He's in Texas working with FEMA. And he'll be there till the end of the month. And we just bless God that he's being used of God to be a relief to people that are going through devastation. <laughs> Praise be to God. We thank him. We bless him. We're going to ask the ministers that they will come forth now that we can share in the Lord's Supper, the communion. Did anybody get inspired from the word this morning? Did it help anybody? It helped me. And with that praise and worship, I tell you, oh, blessed be God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless you. Father, we praise you. Father, we ask you to wash all of us and cleanse us. As we learned in Sunday school this morning, we must start by confessing our sins before God. And you said if we confess our sins before God, you are faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, wash us. Make our hearts pure. We agree with God. What offends God is sin. And so, Lord, take it away from us and make us your righteousness. That's the atonement. Now, God, bless these elements as they symbolize your body and your blood. As we renew our covenant with you, as we renew our faith with you because of grace, we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're going to let the ministers partake first, and then we're going to serve the rest in their seats. We'll serve them in their seat. Bless the Lord. Throw your head back and everybody just say, I'm blessed. blessed. Oh, God. Open this layer and lift that wafer. Hold that wafer up. Hold it up. This is the broken body of Jesus Christ that was broken for you and for me. That's it. That's fine. Let us eat together. Open that cup and expose Satan's terror, the blood of Jesus. It's the blood. Thank you, Jesus. 
This is the blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of our sins. Let us drink together. Praise God. Father, bless them. Bless them beyond their wildest dreams and grant them, oh God, the plans you have for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We will now serve you in your seats so the ministers will prepare. Oh, blessed be the name of God. That's it, that's it. Bless the Lord. You might want to help mom open hers up for her. That's it, that's good. That's it. While you're being served, just say it again. Say, I'm blessed. Mm, thank you, Jesus. His presence is here to heal. Thank you, Lord. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord have laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. We're blessed, saints. Open that top layer and lift that wafer. And ministers, you can point your hands towards the congregation. That's right. Hallelujah to God. This is the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. This is our spiritual nourishment. Let us eat together. Now open that cup. And hold it up. And when you hold that cup up, I want you to say the blood of Jesus. Oh, I want you to say it with more confidence than that. Say the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah to God. This is our guarantee to God's yes. It's the life of God. Because in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So when we have the blood of Jesus, we have the life of God. And this is not just for now. 
this blood will never lose its power. Let us drink together. Now for the next 30 seconds, open your mouth and praise God. Come on. Open your mouth and praise God. Say something good to God. Tell God you love him. Tell God he's great. Tell God he's gracious. Tell God he's loving. Come on, open your mouth and say it to God. Tell God you trust him. Tell God he's altogether lovely. Tell God you love him. Tell God he's the best thing that ever happened to you. Now say hallelujah. Say it again, hallelujah. To God be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Beloved, we thank you for joining us today uh, during this worship experience. We pray that what you've heard today, what you felt today has been a blessing to you and your family. Um, if God has inspired you today, continue to be a part of this virtual experience on this YouTube channel. You can subscribe, you can like, but we pray that you are blessed as a result of our worship, that you are encouraged as a result of the teaching, and that you're inspired by the preached word of God. God bless you and be blessed.